Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this Force 11 session. Um, I'm Dan Katz from the University of Illinois, and I'll be uh, chairing the session. We've got two talks, um, each of which will be 20 minutes, followed by some time for questions and answers. So um, please uh, think of questions. Feel free to put something in the chat, and then I'll, uh, I'll call on you either in the order that there are things in the chat or in the order that people put up their hands. Um, we will go ahead and get started, I think, with this uh, first talk then, um, which is from uh, Tara Renicki on a systematized review of open access mandate research. Uh, and I will stop sharing and let you go ahead. Uh, sorry. There we go. Everybody can see my screen okay? Yeah, it looks good. Great. Let me get started. <clears throat> so thank you so much uh, for coming today. Um, today I'm going to present on some research that some colleagues and I at the University of Nevada, Reno, conducted in the last couple of years. Um, my presentation is called a systematized review of open access mandate research. There we go. So this presentation will kind of cover our research process. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our research goal and what we had hoped to achieve. I'll talk about our process, um, what a systematized review means in this context, um, where we hit some pain points along the, along the way, and what we learned from it, and maybe how we can hopefully improve this sort of research looking forward. Our research goal was to conduct a systematic review of the literature to determine the effectiveness of open access mandates. Now, this definition of a systematic review comes from the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. Um, if you're not unfamiliar with systematic reviews, they come out of the medical field, though they're being um, much more widely used across different disciplines. A systematic review seeks to collate evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria in order to answer a specific research question. And these reviews aim to minimize bias by using explicit systematic methods documented in advance with a protocol. So really authors of systematic reviews aim to find, code, appraise, and synthesize all the previous research surrounding a specific topic uh, or a focused question in an unbiased and transparent matter. There we go. So why does this research matter? Why should we be evaluating, trying to evaluate on a large scale, the impact of open access mandates? Since open access was first proposed, proponents have struggled to get researchers to take part with obviously some disciplines part participating at much higher levels than others. Believing that motivation is one of the reasons authors don't self archive in open access repositories, mandates have become um, the force mandates have been implemented to force the issue and improve this participation. It likely started, of course, in around 2003, but nowadays mandates have become very commonplace in Western Europe and increasingly so in North America. Various studies have found evidence that mandates are connected to increased participation in OA, and some studies have found that certain factors give mandates more strength than others, including the threat of withholding future funding if a particular research project wasn't made open access. And so this is the sticks versus the carrots. <clears throat> and with Plan S and the, the Nelson memo, even more mandates are coming or are here and understanding their success rate of current mandates could impact how future ones are created, how they're worded, how they're enforced, uh, and even how they're tracked. While we initially set out to do a systematic review, issues which will be discussed during this presentation really prevented us from being able to synthesize the research and come to any sort of conclusion about the effectiveness of OA mandates. Reviews like ours are often called systematized reviews. We did a comprehensive search of the literature, created and utilized inclusion exclusion criteria, and conducted a risk of bias assessment. First, we developed our inclusion exclusion criteria to determine what research studies would be included in our systematized review. And our criteria was, was quite strict. Uh, we included studies from around the world, but we by necessity needed to limit it to English language because of the limitations of our research team. We did include different types of mandates, and this is referring to text-based mandates, which are the, the traditional research article that is an output often of research, um, and also the mandates that um, 
required research data to be made open access in some sort of repository. We excluded those that were missing data. And for us, we wanted, for this particular project, we said that um, for articles to be included, they needed to have pre-mandate data and post-mandate data with the same population so that we could determine um, the actual impact. We also excluded studies that had self-reported data. And in this case, we th this might refer to um, researchers at a particular institution surveying faculty to see um, just asking them if they were making their stuff OA. Um, so we excluded that just for kind of trustworthy um, reasons. So next, after creating our inclusion and exclusion criteria, we identified relevant databases. So you can see that we casted a wide net due to the interdisciplinary nature of our topic. Search strings were developed and tailored to each resource, um, utilizing the terms you can see on this slide. The exact search strings are available in our review protocol on the open science framework, and that's what that bit, uh, QR code um, goes to. We conducted our searches during the summer of 2020, and with these initial searches, we found 4,689 articles. These articles were first exported to a shared Zotero folder and then into Rayan, which is a free web-based uh, review screening platform. Our institution has actually since gotten COVID ins, but this particular project was done completely in Rayan. <clears throat> so once the articles were put on Rayan, which is, you'll see a screenshot here on the slide, just if you're not familiar with the, the, the tool, um, this is not our review, but just a demo review being pictured here. But once the articles, we put the citations into Rayan, we did a first round of title and abstract only screening utilizing our, our criteria. We blinded the records and had two librarians look at every article's title and abstract and vote whether or not they met the inclusion criteria. After unblinding the articles, any conflicts in voting were resolved by having a third team member evaluate the article and vote to break the tie. During this phase, we also examined the bibliographies of excluded articles that we thought might have relevant articles in the reference list. And this additional kind of hand searching added 20 more articles that we then also did the title and abstract screening on. Oh, sorry about that. Here we go. After we completed the title and abstract screening phase, we were left with 119 articles. So due to the, the nature of our search terms like open access and open science, which are utilizing really common terms, we were not surprised to see this drastic drop off of pertinent articles. A large number of those 4,700 articles were just completely irrelevant and not dealing with open access in the way that we think about open access um, or in, in around this mandate. So after we got the 119, we collected and uploaded all the full text uh, and put that into Rayan. And then we completed the same blind screening process as before, but this time you read the full text of the article and, and then apply the inclusion exclusion criteria. After this round, we were left with just 11 articles. So in a systematic review, at this point, you will use some sort of critical appraisal tool to check for bias. And screening for a risk of bias helps us as researchers judge an article's trustworthiness um, via things like methodological rigor, the article's relevancy, its results, things of that nature. And for this particular project, we use Glenn's critical appraisal tool for libraries to further evaluate our 11 articles. So Glenn's um, critical appraisal tool for libraries starts off with population and data collection. And some of the things that we were looking for in these articles that were talking about open access mandates um, was the study population. Was um, it representative of all potential uh, eligible users? Are inclusion and exclusion criteria outlined in the article? Is the sample size large enough? Is the resp response rate large enough? Um, is the choice of population bias free? And we didn't include comparative studies, but if we did, there's another group of questions that you would ask as you're evaluating your articles. For data collection, is, are the data collection methods clearly described? Is the instrument validated? Um, does the study measure the outcome at a time appropriate for capturing the intervention's effect? And of course, the intervention in our case is the mandate. Is the instrument included in the publication? Um, and were those involved with the data collection not involved in delivering a service to the target population? When we look at 
study design and results. Study design is concerned mostly with methodology and if it's appropriate for this sort of study. Um, is it clearly stated so that someone could reproduce it? Um, are the outcomes clearly stated? Was ethics approval obtained if necessary? And for the results, are they clearly outlined? Are the confounding variables accounted for? Do the conclusions accurately affect the analysis? And things like, are suggestions provided for further areas to research? So after we did the critical appraisal, just five articles scored 75% or higher, which is what you would necessarily, you typically would need in order for it to be added to the final set for synthesis in a, a systematic review. So within those five results, after 119 articles down to five, within them mandate specifics really varied widely. Uh, they included studies that varied in scope, approach, and method. So not only were the mandates really different, the way that these authors were, were assessing their mandates really varied. If we look at all five, <clears throat> in all but one, <clears throat> excuse me, enacting a mandate or a policy did result in an increased rate of OA publishing uh, and depositing, depending on what the mandate required. However, the inconsistencies and problematic issues that excluded many of the studies from being included in our systematic review really prevented us from being able to reach any sort of conclusion uh, consensus. So with the time I have left, I'm gonna look at the specific areas that OA mandate research struggle to meet expectations required for a systematic review analysis and kind of provide some fodder for how we might wanna do this sort of work moving forward. If we go back to our inclusion and exclusion criteria, there were a couple of issues, particularly with our exclusion criteria. So we excluded articles that didn't have both pre and post mandate data. And we actually, um, 39 articles alone were removed from our study pool because they didn't have pre mandate data. And we recognize that there could be very valid reasons for this. Uh, for example, institutional open access mandates often require that researchers deposit into that institution's repository. Um, but sometimes this repository is actually created in direct response to that mandate. So there is no pre-mandate data because there was no pre-mandate institutional repository. In other cases, there were articles that didn't include any real data at all. They just said it increased or it increased dramatically or we saw a small increase. Um, so there were definitely issues there. And also because we required pre and post mandate data from the same population, it excluded comparison studies where researchers looked at the open access rates of institutions with a mandate and then compared those to institutions that didn't have a mandate. And these would be really valid studies and contribute to our understanding, um, you know, depending on the, the study and the populations used um, and, and all that sort of stuff, different specifics that we would need to look at on a case by case basis could be something that is included in future studies. There were also some common issues with research articles and how they passed or didn't pass Glenn's critical appraisal tool for libraries. Oftentimes the data collection methods were not clearly described within the article. Length of time studied around the interve intervention also varied widely across the articles. Is six months before and after mandate appropriate? Should it be two years? Um, and some had uneven amounts of time on each side of the mandate that they studied, maybe two months before and six months after. And we understand that some of the characteristics of open access mandate assessment studies, like the ones we were trying to find themselves really weigh against passing a critical appraisal tool like this, uh, including the fact that most of these articles are case studies looking at a single instance of a mandate and are often written by the actual individuals that lead the OA efforts on those campuses, uh, including the institutional repository, which is where many of the mandates require deposit. So they often fail this last point on the critical appraisal tool. Within the study design, we saw some issues with clarity and reproducibility of the research methodology sections. They just often weren't detailed enough to give us a clear insight into how they were gathering the statistics, how they were running, uh, analyzing it. 
Many of the studies also didn't include suggestions for further areas of research, um, which could be something that is easily remedied by having a better understanding of what your article might contribute to or help people in creating their own mandates. Those, lots of that could be beneficial here. And the real pain point that we encountered in many of the studies was the lack of confounding variable acknowledgement. There could be a myriad of other reasons for an increased rate of open access mandates outside of a or open access depositing outside of a particular mandate. There might be general increase in awareness of open access on a campus that causes more researchers to deposit into open access repositories. Or a research team might have multiple mandates depending on who their funder is. And so having multiples increases their likelihood of depositing it. There could also be confounding variables accounted for that are encouraging them not to deposit that aren't actually being acknowledged in, in the majority of these types of articles. Uh, and mandate specifics, while not necessarily confounding variables, um, were also really lacking in a lot of these articles. And they should be acknowledged and detailed in these studies to really help suss out like what particular aspects of a mandate make them successful. And our findings are not unique. Um, so a couple of other research teams fairly recently kind of came to some of the same conclusions that we did. In 2018, Lara Vier and Sujimoto said that the future research in this area would benefit from creating a standard for data collecting and analysis, and that it should include other helpful information in reporting and OA mandate effectiveness. Things like detailed enough information to support analysis at the level of a funded, uh, funded projects. Um, so they have some great information and the QR code goes to their nature article. And in 2021, Langhan and Putro, Langhan Putro and team encountered many of the same issues we did when trying to conduct their systematic review of open access citation advantage. They also found issues with data collection with a lack of mandate specifics and a failure for their included articles to pass critical appraisal in order to actually do a systematic analysis. Our suggestions for other researchers looking to evaluate the impact of open access mandates at a systematic level include rethinking the population uh, variables and the inclusion and exclusion criteria. We recognize that different mandate types may not be comparable and that confounding variables might make assessing mandates difficult or even impossible in some cases. And we would recommend possibly loosening future exclusion criteria to allow for studies with no pre-mandate data and for, to allow for comparison studies. And finally, we echo the work of others already mentioned. Uh, we as a field should rethink how we are reporting the impact of open access mandates. Much of this literature is case studies, and by including more mandate specifics and, and acknowledging possible confounding variables, the literature can better help others looking to create their own mandates and allowed for a more field-wide analysis to happen. A standard for reporting open access mandates and their impact would be extremely beneficial. And since this conference was a little delayed, our actual our research has actually just been published and is available at the QR code on this slide. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you so much. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. So we have one question. Um, uh, Sun Young, do you want to do you want to say your question that's in chat? Oh, will you ask me to uh, repeat my question? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, okay, so, <clears throat> um, you know, we have a lot of basic researchers. I understand the system of reviews uh, for clinical research. Is there any possibility we could approach, um, use this, you know, tool to do similar, you know, search for basic science, particularly data repository? You think it's possible or the current tools, you know, don't allow it? Is it specific to, you're doing basically a literature search, right? Public. Right, it's a systematic literature right. research. Uh, we have seen, you know, for different disciplines utilizing it, uh, myself, I'm the engineering librarian here as well. 
Uh, and so we're, I'm helping, I'm working on a team with environmental engineering faculty and students, grad students, and we're doing a systematic review um, of a particular topic. There are different types of systematic reviews, and sometimes they might be scoping in nature, and sometimes you can do a meta-analysis where you combine all the data together um, and, and figure out, get your solution that way. Um, so I think it's possible. I think the critical bias tool is the, the biggest thing that we, um, there, there are other tools out there like replacements for Prisma and, and different critical appraisal tools um, that are becoming more widely available for discipline specific. So I suspect it is quite possible. Um, it also just depends on the nature, as you saw in this, um, of the articles that are being written and whether or not there's enough data in them for you to draw conclusions on a, on a, a field wide. <laughs> So the system, the, what I like about system review is very structured yeah. and then it's very standardized. So, you know, there's no um, variability in, you know, well quality control. But if you're searching data repository without this sort of structured method, it can be very um, disorganized. And we get a lot of requests about, you know, can we have a list of, you know, data about a certain topic? And I wonder, you know, mm. can we develop something like this that we can apply to basic science research, like a data search, for example, is sure. all the case. That's a great idea. And I don't see why we couldn't like um, taking taking the principles of a traditional systematic review from right. the medical field, right, mm -hmm. and applying it to like searching for through data repositories. And you do, right? And like, I still have yeah. faculty who who don't realize different searches get me different results and things of that nature. So that's a great question. I, I would like to start the initiative somehow with a lot of people <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> joining me in this initiative. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Are there other questions? So I guess, um, I, so I was curious about one, which is um, I think related to the Kind of the, the the structured methodology effectively. Um, you talked about the seventy five percent criteria, um, and it seems like, well, I mean, first just the the fact that any numeric criteria is kind of a, right. a, a very uh, uh, a very strict line and something that's not really a very uh, uh, and something that's kind of varying quite a bit across that line. Um, I guess I am I'm just kind of curious. Are, why why 75 percent are there are there some factors that actually are more important than another um, than than others is there would there be other ways of looking at this too so to... different yeah no yeah different fields use like different percentages and so this was because of the nature of the articles and once we got down to 11 and we're reading these articles <clears throat> and we start looking at critical appraisal tools and we're wondering if any of our articles can pass them um, and in trying to do this systematic review, you know, we have this one from 2006 that was created for librarian, uh, librarian studies, which isn't necessarily what we were researching, um, and it was the best fit that we could find. Um, so 75% was recommended, and that's what we went for. They're all weighted equally. Whether or not they should be is, you know, totally, I, I agree with that, it's completely up for discussion. Um, and even... Um, once you get into a critical appraisal tool, they tend to have the guiding questions. I, of course, just gave the, the main questions and then under each of them, any good tool will have a description of what you're looking for. Um, even with that description, um, without inferring what you're reading from, from the article, um, it was really tricky. Um, and we had to have discussions as a team about, well, can we read that into these two sentences in the methodology section? Can we really do that? Or, you know, they should have included if, it, if that was the case. Um, so it was really tricky. And so, but that was uh, the most disappointing part of our entire process was um, picking it out, realizing this wasn't going to be a good fit and there was no current good tools at the time. Um, so these are just made, luckily, by researchers, right? Um, and so I think we there's certainly opportunity to make better critical appraisal tools for research like this. So. Yeah, sorry. So when you were um, your comment about that they're weighted equally, you mean to the criteria that go into deciding the seventy five percent, right? Okay. Yeah. So yep. I guess the other I guess the other thing that I was thinking about when you said that um, is, what if you actually um, 
kind of took more papers um, and weighted them by how critically appraised they were in some sense. So things that were right higher, like, I don't know, something that was 100 would be weighted more highly than something that was 10. In, in terms of coming up with kind of the final results of all the papers, not not of the appraisal of each paper. That would be so. Uh, that would be interesting, right? Your your results section would be a little bit more convoluted if you're wanting to like separate out like from our the 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 twenty papers that achieved a high level, a passing level of critical appraisal. Here's what they they the conclusions were. If we add the other, you know, depending on the size of your what your topic is, the other forty papers, you know, the data starts getting a little bit more clear, a little bit more fine tuned. However, we take this with a grain of salt. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I guess I was just thinking that like some of the, it, it's, it's more, more likely than not that some of the papers, right. Aren't the, the ones that are entirely right. And the other ones are entirely incorrect, but I don't know how you, how you work between them, but. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Kate makes an excellent point in the chat uh, that it's common in the health and medic medical okay. fields to have that kind of sensitive analysis. Great, thanks, Kate. Did did you want to say anything else as well, Kate? No. Okay. All right. Uh, any last question before we go on? Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Tara. That was. I think that was really interesting. Um, just before we go on to the second talk, I realize I didn't actually. Um, uh, kind of do all the pieces that I was supposed to do for a second. So let me just really quickly um, talk through the different uh, pieces. Um, so, I'm sorry. Uh, so we are here at the FORCE 2023 conference from FORCE 11. Um, the membership is free from FORCE 11 and anybody that's not a member should certainly uh, join if you're at all interested. Um, we have a bunch of sponsors that have enabled us to do this, even though this is virtual, there are um, costs associated with AV and, and setup and, and other things. And so uh, Crossref and CZI in particular as platinum sponsors and all of the gold sponsors we'd like to, to acknowledge and, and thank specifically, uh, along with all the volunteers and all the community groups that have been involved. Um, the sessions are going to be available uh, via recordings after the event. And there is a code of conduct, which you can see. And we're using a force11-conference uh, hashtag, um, as well as a Slack channel. And then finally, I'll just mention the, the Fiske 2023 event will be coming up. The uh, Scholarly Communications Institute that Force 11 has run um, six or several years uh, in the past. Uh, from July 31st to August 4th with 14 courses and a bunch of keynotes and community events. And so if you're interested in something that's more uh, more focused on kind of learning best practices and less on, on presenting new results, then that would be something that should be of interest. Okay, having said that then, let's, um, let's go on to the second talk. Uh, so this will be uh, Hao Ye, who's going to talk about uh, grant proposals and what happens with those. And so if you want to go ahead and share your screen, can start. Okay, looks good. Thank you. All right. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of members of our, our research group. Uh, so myself, um, Hao Yi, uh, Perry Collins, Hannah Toombs, and Natalia Rube Castaneda. Uh, so our project is on bringing transparency and openness to sharing grant proposals. Uh, this is an IMLS funded project. Uh, I wanted to thank all, all our past and current members of our team at the University of Florida. Uh, so a number of people are involved in different aspects of this project. Uh, in addition, uh, thanking the members of our external advisory group. Um, so these are folks who uh, have been involved in providing guidance on the project. Um, and representing different sectors interested in this topic of grant proposals, sharing grant proposals, how do you make this part of uh, kind of the general academic ecosystem of uh, you know, sharing scholarly output and knowledge uh, to other people. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, this kind of idealized cartoon of 
a research uh, life cycle. Um, you know, this is you know definitely just a caricature, uh, but you know we can see this kind of like common uh, phases of you know how research ideas progress from you know the idea phase, the designing of a study, collection of data, performing uh, data analysis, drawing conclusions, and then presenting and publishing uh, those results. Um, and what we have seen already is that you know there are ways in which openness and transparency have been brought to different phases of this research cycle. Um, so open access is definitely one very big and well-known uh, implementation of openness, um, specifically focusing on uh, this uh, you know phase of presenting and publishing results. Uh, but we've also seen a number of initiatives that bring openness and transparency to different phases of this research cycle, right? So in uh, the designing of studies, uh, there has been you know, initiatives about uh, pre-registering studies and, and sharing those uh, registrations of the study design before data has been collected, um, initiatives to uh, mandate or to promote um, sharing data sets uh, that are associated with publications or associated with research, um, sharing code that has been used to perform the analysis, um, sharing preprints um, so that the results uh, and conclusions can be shared before uh, you know a, the publication has gone through peer review. Um, and then there's this like face here about the generation of research ideas. Um, and so this is where um, you know I think that grant proposals uh, fit in. Um, and certainly there are different ways in which um, you know this 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 stage of the research cycle uh, could be made more open and transparent. Um, one of them is through uh, sharing grant proposals, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, but there are also other kinds of platforms that have been developed um, that involve kind of sharing and publishing, um, you know, little tidbits of research ideas. Uh, so if you've seen platforms uh, like Research Equals or Science Octopus, um, there are these kinds of, you know, micro publishing platforms that can also be used to kind of share research ideas that aren't the same as, um, you know, full fledged grant proposals. Um, I didn't want to exclude the fact that grant proposals are shared um, in a variety of means. Uh, many researchers already engage in sharing in one or more ways. Uh, these can include writing groups or co-working groups between colleagues. Um, researchers often uh, participate in classes or training programs um, at maybe an early stage of their career uh, where they may write grants or, or fellowship applications as part of that class or training program. Uh, there are also ad hoc collections or online platforms where grant proposals are shared. Um, one of those is ogrants.org, uh, which is a project that was started by uh, my one of my postdoc advisors, Ethan White. Uh, and that website uh, was funded by a Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, uh, data-driven discovery initiative uh, funding. Um, so this is kind of an extend, extend, extension of that work. And one of the things that uh, you know, my collaborators at the University of Florida and I talked about when we were thinking about how to extend that work is exactly what we were going to do. Um, and one of the you know, kind of obvious ideas is, well, let's you know, increase um, you know, the technical capacity. Uh, you know, let's build out this like really cool like prototype system. Um, but we also, you know, had the experience that a lot of these uh, kind of technological prototypes um, don't end up being sustainable, right? Um, they get started, you know, there's a lot of excitement, um, they don't necessarily continue, or maybe the, the individuals who are involved um, manage to grow a large audience um, and sell out to a for-profit publisher. Um, and of course, that would be great for us as the team members, um, maybe less great uh, for you know the, the kind of academic um, system in general. Uh, so what we ended up doing is uh, applying for an IMLS planning grant um, and going through a planning process where we really wanted to identify uh, kind of the boundaries of the problem um, of sharing grant proposals as well as the kind of boundaries for you know what are the different kinds of solutions and what are the you know pros and cons of those different kinds of solutions, right? Um, so 
motivated by uh, trying to get at um, what can be achieved by the process of sharing grant proposals openly and widely, um, as well as what it would take to kind of get that practice uh, to be implemented broadly. Uh, so our approach had multiple parts to it. Um, we started with an environmental scan um, to identify the kind of what has been done historically. Uh, we wanted to make sure to have a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, so that included uh, a meeting of our external advisory group, uh, individual interviews that we conducted with different stakeholders, uh, community conversations that will go more in depth with some of the specific issues with targeted communities, and then to produce some draft implementation plans um, to kind of give an idea of like, well, if you were going to try and, you know, develop grant proposal sharing um, as a broadly implemented practice, how would you get started? You know, we were going to take kind of the input from what we have uh, gathered through our environmental scan and our stakeholder engagement to come up with some draft ideas of kind of what, you know, what would be like some foundational pieces to work with. So I'm going to review some of these uh, components in a little bit more detail. Uh, so for the environmental scan, uh, we focused on what is the state of open sharing of grant proposals and other kinds of research materials. Um, this had kind of two parts to it. One was a repository analysis um, where our, our research fellow, Hannah Toombs, uh, really looked deeply into kind of different uh, repositories where uh, research materials were shared. Um, and so going beyond just kind of like publications and into things like data sets, um, other kinds of uh, materials. Uh, I think there was, um, I think we talked about even uh, like job postings uh, at one point. Uh, so a bunch of different kinds of uh, repositories. Um, and then a literature review about the state of open access publishing, um, open access initiatives uh, that have been uh, created for sharing scholarly materials. Um, and even examples of open access grant materials. Um, so I'm only going to summarize a little bit of the results because this is a manuscript that is still under revision. Generally, we found you know grant proposals are not really shared open access, uh, but there uh, were lots of um, uh, you know statements that examples of grant proposals are often useful for training purposes, um, in particular institutions. Uh, sometimes face challenges where they have limited resources and examples of grant proposals. Um, those challenges can be exacerbated if that institution or that um, you know academic unit has had you know a lack of a prior history in writing and sharing proposals and, and related materials. When grant proposals are shared publicly on repositories, uh, one of the challenges has is that there is no common metadata standard for how to label them. Um, and so that means even if they are shared, if there are not you know, useful identifiers or common identifiers for describing the content of the proposals uh, or where the proposals uh, were submitted, uh, that often limits uh, the discoverability uh, and reuse of those materials. Uh, in May of last year, uh, we held our advisory group meeting. Um, so we brought in our advisory group members um, who spanned a variety of roles around grants, um, including researchers, technologists, educators, program officers who are involved in different kinds of funding agencies um, and grant programs, um, and research administrators from uh, universities and other institutions. So we held um, several discussions over these two days, um, really focusing on some of the challenges and friction points that uh, people had in their experiences in dealing with grants, um, as well as what are the solutions, some of the possible solutions to make grant proposals more available. Uh, here's just a few of the photos uh, that we took during uh, that advisory group uh, meeting discussion. And so just to kind of synthesize some of the themes that we talked about in terms of the barriers to sharing, you know, researchers uh, talked about how there was limited time and effort. Um, and so focusing on sharing grant proposals um, and spending time and effort there meant that there was less that would be available for research or other kinds of activities that were more valued uh, by their job. There's also competition among researchers um, and fears of being scooped if grant proposals are shared. There's a fear of scrutiny by other researchers 
um, or by the public uh, when grant proposals are shared. Uh, so this could be the case that you know researchers are kind of evaluating um, and looking for you know uh, you know outputs that did, don't always line up with what is proposed in the research, uh, or from the perspective of funding agencies um, sharing grant proposals. Uh, that might be on you know topics that uh, the public has you know sensitivities about um, or is politically uh, opinionated in some way. Uh, there can be um, kind of you know a, you know harassment that results from that kind of sharing. There's a lack of value or recognition for sharing grant proposals. Um, oftentimes, the lack of clarity or precedent in sharing grant proposals is a barrier. Um, so there's not really clear uh, policy from institutions about what can be shared legally. Uh, you know, lots of uh, discussions around like, you know, if it's a public institution, then the salaries of, you know, all the employees are already public, um, but that's not the case for private institutions. And so, you know, considerations around sharing the budget component of grant proposals sometimes runs into that issue. There might be IP restrictions or other kinds of institutional policy that just doesn't cover uh, grant proposals. There's lots of uncertainty about how to share um, metadata or what even is appropriate metadata, um, as well as the kind of lack of resources to generally make the usage of shared materials user friendly. Uh, if you've ever kind of like, you know, looked at the grant package that uh, is, set, is sent off to some of these federal funding agencies, it's, you know, a large number of pages, um, which of which, you know, maybe you know, a small fraction of it is actually the like content about the research idea. We also explored and discussed some of these uh, possible benefits, right? Again, using example proposals and training um, from a meta researcher perspective, the ability to analyze common themes across proposals and look at funding patterns, um, having professional recognition for the individuals who are involved and work on proposals. Um, because those are not always the same individuals who are as deeply involved in carrying out the research and so may not be credited uh, on the subsequent outputs. Uh, new opportunities uh, that might result from citation or collaboration if those individuals are recognized as being involved in creating the grant proposals. Uh, from funding agencies, the ability to take unfunded projects or ideas and redirect them to other kinds of funding streams that may be more appropriate. And then uh, also promoting consistency in proposal um, and RFP structure across different funding calls. Uh, that can also be a way to kind of simplify some of the workflows from both uh, funders who are evaluating proposals um, and researchers who are submitting proposals. Uh, over September, December through September, de se de through December last year, uh, we also conducted individual interviews uh, with um, different folks, so grant applicants, research administrators, educators, program officers, some of the researchers who study grants. Uh, so we asked some questions about kind of the role that these individuals had in the grants process, uh, some of their experiences and concerns with sharing grant proposals and some of the possible uses for shared grant proposals. Um, just to summarize some of the themes, you know, in addition, you know, some of this is going to be a little bit repetitive of kind of our other kinds of stakeholder engagement, um, but some of the uses for shared grant proposals, things like, you know, being able to understand the fit or scope of a funding call um, uh, before applying. Uh, if it's an applicant's first proposal to a funding call, having the examples of kind of the structure um, and the style and the language and tone that is appropriate. Uh, examples of structuring and organizing applications. And again, for the kind of meta research about uh, what uh, has been funded, things like research trends, the evolution and ideas over time, and transparency and funding. Uh, we talked about grants as uh, a, a different kind of research work uh, that could be shared um, and that can be used to demonstrate the effort that is involved in uh, proposing uh, research. Uh, and that can be useful in cases where there is a lag time between when grants are submitted um, and research publications eventually happen. And of course, there are also cases where research publications don't always happen as a result of a grant uh, being funded. Grants can also be a different perspective on a research topic uh, in the sense that they are sometimes, they're often broader in scope than individual publications. 
uh, as well as being more forward thinking in terms of how they uh, describe a research idea. I uh, talked about the recognition in applying to grants. Um, generally, it's the case from the perspective of individuals that grants are only valued by bringing in money, so there's not always recognition for applying. Some individuals in some locations uh, do have uh, you know, a little bit of informal celebration of applications, uh, but generally that you know, is not kind of broadly shared. Petition individuals vary in how they document, uh, whether they submit grants on their CDs, um, and especially with whether unfunded grant proposals are, are described on CDs or not. Uh, some individuals involved in kind of preparing conference programs noted that uh, when there's grant funded work, uh, it can be useful to note that in abstracts and kind of put those uh, related projects together if they're funded by similar calls. Uh, and that can help as a, as a way of kind of like, you know, seeding in some of the research networking that happens um, when those programs are being developed. Of course, we also talked about the sensitivities in sharing grants and what are the components of grants uh, that have sensitivities, things like detailed budgets and, and private salary information. Uh, if there are letters of support uh, that are being written by researchers that are not the ones who are proposing uh, the, the grant, uh, personal statements um, in cases where you know, fellowship applications have a research component and a personal statement component. Sometimes uh, you know, grant proposals contain language that is a little bit more frank about other research that is being done. Um, and so maybe a little bit more critical uh, that the, the author doesn't want to be published uh, publicly, uh, that there are ideas that are in grant proposals that may eventually be adapted into businesses or intellectual property, uh, or and that the grant proposals might have things like personal data, community data, other kinds of sensitive um, information that uh, might fall under things like non-disclosure agreements. So uh, that was part of our uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, in addition to the kind of uh, stakeholder engagement parts, we also have some draft implementation plans that we are working on. One of these is a metadata schema to think about how we might organize grant proposals um, in a way that might be useful and help link them to other objects. Um, so thinking about possible use cases here, like meta research on grant proposals and distribution of funding, meta research on research ideas and trends. If individuals are looking for examples of grant proposals that are specific to a call or specific to a field, uh, as well as ways that we might be able to link um, uh, the, the shared grant proposals with identifiers for uh, other objects like publications, data, researchers, and institutions. So this is work that's ongoing. Uh, we hope to share this soon as a, one of the outputs for this project. Uh, another output we are working on is this ethical engagement plan. So focusing on the kind of specific concerns about what could be shared. Um, and so and, and for this uh, document, it will be you know, less prescriptive in the sense that there are going to be many kinds of use cases where um, you know, the different levels of sharing might be appropriate. Um, and so this is going to be more of a like, well, here are th some things to think about if you are going to be designing a mechanism for sharing grant proposals and where you can make some choices about what you want to be shared and what are those uh, what are those kind of specific concerns that we have uh, kind of synthesized through our stakeholder engagement on just to make that more readily available for any kind of uh, official implementation. Uh, I did leave out uh, our community conversations part of the stakeholder engagement. That's because that is uh, actually an ongoing recruitment um, so our community feedback experts are going to be involved in helping to inform and shape this project. Uh, and the three targeted communities we have are libraries and archives, especially in academic spaces, uh, postdoctoral and early career researchers in STEM fields, um, and Caribbean studies, especially in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, if you are interested in that, uh, we have some responsibilities that are involved uh, and expected for our community feedback experts. Uh, but there is also a $1,000 stipend attached for your service to the project. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, please um, go ahead and visit our website uh, for that, um, uh, for those details and application process. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat um, once I'm done with this talk. So to summarize, 
uh, you know, there are like lots of different challenges and benefits to sharing grant proposals. Uh, we definitely think there's no, you know, single social or technological intervention that will be sufficient um, and really requires coordination and buy-in from multiple sectors. Um, in terms of shifting practices, um, based on experiences of, you know, individuals and our stakeholders, grant research communities are, are kind of best situated to develop those different ways of engaging researchers um, and to shift those practices. All right, thanks very much. Okay, thank, thank you as well. Uh, another nice talk. Um, let's see, we have a bunch of questions and comments in the chat, which we can work through. And if anybody wants to ask another question, again, please put up your hand or, or put something in the chat. Um, we'll start maybe with uh, Todd had a question about metadata. Todd, do you want to ask that? Sorry, I needed a multiple unmutes. Um, I asked this earlier in the in the uh, earlier in the presentation, but I'm kind of thinking about what you said early about there not being consistent metadata for grants. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, would there be anything interesting that you could derive analysis from that is different from the obvious types of things like orchids and drawers and dates and maybe um, you know it's a uh, kind of research field. Are there um, It'd be interesting to hear from you what what sort of metadata might be useful to draw analysis from if it was consistent across the ecosystem. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think definitely kind of some of the standard elements that you already mentioned here, uh, identifiers for individuals, institution, dates. Um, I think I saw a comment from Sun Young about, um, you know, like keywords, controlled vocabulary that are domain specific and discipline specific, um, specific kinds of like maybe funding calls. Um, one suggestion was also that um, in addition to kind of storing the grant proposal um, to also store the funding call because funding calls also change over time. And so it can be really useful to see, you know, this grant was submitted for this funding call and at this year, and then that kind of have, may have changed or in, in some cases, you know, you know, funding calls are, are you know, very transient in time, of course, as well. Uh, but yeah, you know, lots of different kinds of uh, information related there. Um, nothing kind of immediately obvious to me about, you know, specific things that are interesting in, in kind of proposed metadata so far. Just, um, I guess, just to follow up slightly on that, um, uh, Sung Young had put in a couple of comments, but also it asked a question. So I don't know if you, uh, Sung Young, if you want to um, say anything or ask your question. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I mentioned, uh, in addition to keywords, um, the activity code is very unique to grant proposals. So if we can put that in, uh, it might be included in FOA, but <clears throat> um, I don't know if you need to create like a separate fields for activity code uh, and FOA, you know, um, that might be helpful when you develop a metadata schema for grant proposals. How close are you guys in terms of finalizing uh, metadata schema, if you don't mind me asking? Um, we have a draft. Uh, it's, it, it just has taken some time to kind of bring everyone together to give feedback on it um, and, and really to kind of sift through um, the kind of brainstormed possibilities of like, here are like, you know, a hundred different possible fields into like, well, let's, think about what are like the actual things that should be prioritized um, in, in the metadata and for what reasons. Um, so it exists. Uh, I will definitely be, be shared as one of the outputs uh, from this project, uh, just taking some time to kind of get everything done. Sure. And where do you plan to publish that? Uh, we're not sure yet. Um, I, I think anything that isn't going to go into an open access journal, uh, we're probably going to put onto an o OSF uh, project at some point. Thanks. All right, let's see. There were, um, there's a couple of comments from uh, Tess and Brian. Um, I think they're just comments as opposed to questions, but if either of you wants to say anything, please speak up. Okay, and then um, 
I'll say, I, so I had a, a question that I was curious about, which is um, that a lot of the, the general issues that you've talked about seem like they're similar to the issues around sharing a lot of different types of research outputs. And so I was just, I was wondering like, what, what do you see as uniquely different about grant proposals from other objects? I mean, they're unique because grant proposals are, are, are unique, right? I mean, I think, you know, there are, when we think about research, right? Like there's the publication, there's data, there's code, there's the grant proposals. They're all related. They all cover some of the same content, but they're also unique, right? Otherwise, why would we have them existing? Um, and so, I, you know, I think from, you know, the kind of, if you were to go from like, first principles of open research and say like, well, everything should be open as, as open as, as you know, feasibly possible um, and within good reason, um, I think it makes sense to think about what are the other kinds of um, outputs um, that are, are the other kinds of labor that's being done that um, isn't also, um, you know, being made uh, as open and transparent as possible. Okay, so I, I guess really what I meant is that because a grant proposal effectively is a text document, more or less, what, what aspects of it being a grant proposal are different than uh, kind of lead to different questions than you would have for other text documents like papers or preprints? Ah, um, there's, there's definitely different content involved. Um, you know, the budgeting piece is 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 like big and complicated in ways uh, that I, I did not anticipate going in. Um, so, for example, you know, um, people who are uh, proposing research uh, or writing or, or are researchers who are thinking about writing their own grant proposals, understanding how like other research is done in terms of allocating funding for, for different costs uh, is, you know, there's a really useful component to that in the planning process that you wouldn't get just from looking at a publication necessarily. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's some like really, there's, there's definitely different and unique content and grant proposals that you don't just see um, at the publication stage. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, so trying to wrap up, I, I did put in a link to the next session, which will be starting in uh, one or two minutes, but um, there was also, uh, uh, sorry, you've, you've answered the funder question in chat from Tess. That's great. Um, Sally, did you want to say anything briefly? No, no, my comment's in there. That's all. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then uh, also a question about NIH reporter. Um, is that is that relevant? How? Um, what about NIH reporter? Well, I, I added. I have to run to another meeting, but I just I threw that in because if we, if you got funded, you can get a lot of details uh, about the proposal, grant proposal, uh, from uh, NIH report. I put the link in. So I'm wondering, you know, our institution has our own <clears throat> system where they can actually um, share the grant proposals to help other junior faculty or whoever. So, but it's a closed system. It's not open system. But if it's funded, you can get a lot of information from and I's reporter. So I'm wondering how you would differentiate between that and uh, your open um, system. Yeah, that's a great question, actually, um, because one of the one of the kind of perspectives on sharing grant proposals is is looking at things like uh, funding equity across institutions and across researcher demographics. Um, and as you noted, you know, a lot of that information is already publicly available, right? When you look for funded awards, you can find some of those, uh, some of those data already. Um, you know, why do you need anything more beyond, uh, you know, kind of just like the abstract and just the kind of summary, summary details of the funded awards? Um, and so that's kind of, that, those are some of the questions that are driving kind of our, our digging deeper into, you know, what are the different components of grants? How would they be used um, in, in different ways? Um, in addition to kind of like some of the ideas around things like funding equity. Okay, so um, so in the interest of time, because we're just at the time that the lightning talks are started, I'm going to say that we'll we'll stop here. There are a couple of other questions in chat. If anybody wants to follow up with how, let's um, let's just try to do that offline email, something like that. Um, so thank you then to both the speakers and thanks to all the attendees, and I'll see you at the lightning talk session. Okay, thanks. Bye.